Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read Better Not More. Today I have two puppies. <laughs> Today is the first day also that we will be doing a new video series. We'll be doing the Odyssey. We just wrapped up talking about the Iliad on my channel. And so a lot of the introductory material will be relevant here as well. I'll link that playlist above and below uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to check it out, especially those first like three videos in that series will be helpful providing contextual information for this book as well. But one topic that I wanted to revisit in setting this book up is about Homer, the historical context, um, and a little bit about geography. So let's jump in. So in my last video addressing Homer, I received an excellent comment from Libby Stevenson, which I've pinned in the comments on that video. She brought up a lot of valid corrections to what the information that I presented. So I highly encourage you to check out what she wrote. And again, thank you Libby for bringing that up. It's always a bit embarrassing when you get something wrong, but she made her comments in such a polite and kind way. And I really love and appreciate that. And that's really what this channel is all about. Like I said, I don't have all the answers. History is definitely not my strong suit. And I want to know when I'm wrong. I don't want to be giving out false information on my videos, especially when I do it so confidently. So I love having that kind of conversation with you guys. So I definitely invite you to feel free to make corrections when it's necessary. And I really appreciate the kind way in which she did it. So her most important point was about Homer himself. And she rightly pointed out that I didn't really make it clear enough that history does not presume that Homer was a single historical person who wrote either the Iliad or the Odyssey as a solo effort. What contextual information here that's important to keep in mind is that the ancient Greek communities at the time of the composition of these epic stories is oral. Not only were they performed orally, they also weren't written down until several hundred years later. So this means that there were many bards who put their own unique spin on the story as it was told and retold. Oral compositions like this are much better understood as the production of the, a whole of a culture as a whole of in their time period than as works of single authorship or single creators as we think of modern books or songs or paintings or whatever. The second point that Libby brought up that I want to discuss here is the debate regarding whether or not Homer, whoever he was, or if there was such a single person, was the essential voice in both compositions. I reported in my first video that according to Lattimore in his introduction to the Iliad, he indicated that most scholars agreed that both poems were strongly influenced or perhaps originally composed by the same person. However, Libby brought to my attention that the debate over this question is a lot more robust than what I had indicated. I don't know if the discussion has developed since Lattimore's time or if it was merely a simple for his purposes, but regardless, it's definitely not as easy as I presented it in my video. And while I was dubious of this idea at first, after finishing the two epics back to back, I have my own questions about this. So authorship. So let's start with the counter uh, position. In the introduction to the Odyssey, Lattimore again argues for that the same person was strongly influential in the poems that we have today. And what are his reasons? That the Iliad and Odyssey make similar anachronisms. This certainly points to their composition at the same time and at the same distance of time from the originating events that inspired the story. Two, the Odyssey is a highly coherent sequel to the Iliad, and this is probably one of his most compelling arguments, in my opinion. And what does he mean by this? He means that there aren't any contradictions between the Iliad and the Odyssey, nor does it needlessly repeat events that are clearly told in the Iliad, but it does include stories and tales that are outside the scope of that epic, so it's really only additive to the story of the Iliad. This doesn't prove the same poet but it does prove that whoever was principal in composing the Odyssey was very, very familiar with the Iliad. The language meter and rhythm of the poems is very similar. If it's two po different poets, then they were definitely trained in the same tradition. 
But Lattimore also points out differences as well, and here are some of the notes that he makes. It's really about the general style of the narrative. So the epic focuses on relatively small groups, not the sweeping perspectives of war that we have in the Iliad. The first-person narrative style of Odysseus really exemplifies this. Hermes, rather than Iris, is the messenger of the gods. Aphrodite, not Charis, is the wife of Hephaestus. And there are far fewer and less imaginative epic similes. So the epic similes are just almost non-existent in this story, and they're not as skillfully and artfully created. I have my own differences to point out as well. Some of this dif these differences that I want to talk about next may point to different authorship, but some of them may be just the necessary results of the different subject matter. The first and most essential difference between the two texts is that one is a comedy and one is a tragedy. You can always tell by the way that it ends. So does it end with a funeral? Do is it a bloodbath? Does everyone die? Guess what? That's a tragedy. Does it end in marriage? Does it end in a birth? Does it end in reconciliation? It's a comedy. And you will note that by this definition, all romances are comedies as well, unless they're a romantic tragedy because the lovers never get together and they die. That's a, that's a tragedy too. So the Iliad ending not only in the funeral of Patroclus, but also with the return of Hector's body for his own funeral, it's a tragedy. The Odyssey ends with Penelope and Odysseus returning to the marriage bed, a comedy. And as a result, there are some amazing comedic scenes throughout. My favorite is naked Odysseus approaching the Phycaean ladies and like scaring them half to death. It is a gem. It is wonderful. A difference that puts significant doubt into my mind about the unified authorship is that of the structure of the poems. So the construction of the Iliad is nearly perfect. It's just it's so good, you guys. And as I mentioned in my poetry video, there have been some scholars who have outlined the epic cycles, those units of parallel structure, not only across the whole poem, but also with even within the books themselves, which it's important to note that books were added later for the convenience of readers who should not imagine the bard saying, book 12, and then like continuing. He would have just performed the story all the way through. Book divisions aside, it still reveals a profound internal coherence and complexity. The Odyssey, on the other hand, seems to be quite unwieldy in the hands of its poet. First, let's outline the structure to take a look at this. So part one is books one through four. That's the Telemachy, which tell about Telemachus taking action to find out what happened to his father. Books five through eight tell about Odysseus leaving the island of Calypso and coming to the Phycaeans. Then in books nine through 12, Odysseus tells his own story, which sort of catches us up, right? So he tells a story from leaving Troy and then how he got to the island of Calypso, which shores up that hole in the narrative. Then books 13 through 24 tell about Odysseus leaving the Phycaeans and then the rest of his time at Ithaca, right? So here we have no parallel structure, no recapitulations of scenes. Now part of this is the nature of the story. Odysseus goes on a bunch of adventures. He's wandering and then he eventually comes home. The Telemachy seems ill-placed in such a story and we begin, as with the Iliad, in media res, in the middle of things. But the middle is literally the middle of Odysseus' own story. We have to go back and catch everybody up in like long interludes of what has happened so far. And that even happens in the Telemachy where Telemachus goes and visits you know, one of the other kings and he's like, well, let me tell you about something that happened at Troy or on my way home or whatever. So we're all constantly having to like catch the audience up. Whereas the middle in the Iliad is literally just the middle of this great war, but the story sort of starts and then proceeds and goes forwards. It doesn't have to do this like catch up business. The need to have Odysseus tell what happened before puts another constraint upon the telling, and it's that first person narrative. Whereas the Iliad is extremely mobile in its perspective, you may recall like the narrator's ability to zoom in on the finest detail of na nature and then zoom out to the most expansive view of the gods, this f section feels very stifled by Odysseus's limited perspective. At one point in his tale, it's almost as if like the narrator can't help but bring in the grandiose perspective of the gods. Odysseus in book 12, lines 374 and following, starts telling about how Zeus responded to one of his prayers and some actions of the gods on Olympus. And the poet has to like kind of quickly recover from this flub up, I would say. And Odysseus like adds quickly, I learned about this later from Calypso. 
Um, for me, this is evidence that the narrator is just not as skilled in this epic, or at least is confined by the choices he has made. The result is that there's far less involvement from the gods. We see far fewer scenes from the gods on Olympus. We don't have convocations about what to do and who's on what side. Only Athena, Zeus, Hermes, and Poseidon seem particularly involved, and their appearances are few and far between, uh, except for Athena, who operates as a literal deus ex machina at various necessary events. This may be because the life and adventures of one Greek hero variously shipwrecked and struggling to get home is not worth the time and serious consi consideration that two superpowers at war might warrant. But it really changes the feel of the story. Divine intervention is a major force in the story in that Poseidon's anger prevents Odysseus from coming home and Athena's assistance eventually accomplishes it, but it's minor in its thematic importance. It is a major theme in the Iliad. Instead, we have strange lands and many mythical creatures. The epic flavor of the story comes not so much from the interaction with the gods or its sweeping narrative, but rather with its interaction with the strange and mysterious space that it makes up in the world. And I really love this difference in the, in the story. The geographic landscape is obviously much different because Odysseus is wandering. He's not stuck at one spot trying to win a war. So we see known places mentioned like Egypt, but also mythical places like the land of the Lotus Eaters, the Sirens, the Underworld, the Island of the Cyclops. Here, horrible creatures, lesser known gods, and greater men make a strange mix of beings that can be encountered simply by sailing around in the physical world. Only the underworld needs to be accessed by some magical means and seems to indicate the crossing of a metaphysical border. This really gives a sense of like, there be dragons, the sense that the outs outside the known Mediterranean world, the Greeks imagined just as many fantastical places as medieval Europeans did. So in my conclusion, I do want to address the question that I teased at the end of my Iliad series, the question from EK, which he sent me on Instagram. He asked why I thought the Odyssey is more popular and seems to inspire more stories and adaptation than does the Iliad. So in consideration of all of the differences I laid out, I have some ideas. One, the Odyssey is super fun. It is so fun. It is jam-packed of plot, humor, adventure, mysterious places and creatures. The Iliad is a tragedy ending in the deaths of Patroclus and Hector. Both feel inevitable and senseless. So in one sense, if you're gonna make a rough difference here, you might say that the Iliad is more of a high art and the Odyssey is more of a low art, although they're both very fine pieces of art. Odysseus is also more fun than Achilles. Achilles is kind of like this mopey, a little bit depressed guy who can't figure out what the meaning of life is and how he should live his life. He's dealing with these big questions about his purpose. Odysseus is a great fighter, but he's clever. He's a bit like Sherlock Holmes. He's the guy you love rooting for and having on your side, even if you watch him make mistakes. And number three, Odysseus is a lot more human and empathetic. So you're watching this man long to go home to his wife. He didn't really want to fight in the first place. He doesn't care about having the most beautiful woman in the world. He cares about having his Penelope, who's truly his equal, who is so faithful and waits for him. You know, he doesn't want to leave his son. He's a family man. He doesn't want to be the consort of Calypso or Circe. He just wants to go home. So that is a lot of ground covered. I feel like I went on an epic journey myself, along with you. You were on my ship sailing through. Okay, leave that metaphor alone. But that's all I have for you today. Sometimes I can go in way too deep, you guys. I like epic metaphors myself, but they're just not as good. For those of you who have read both books, I would love to know which you prefer. And do you think one person was the primary source of both stories? And this is what I'm starting to think. Possibly two different authors. Which do you think? So comment down below. My next video, I will be tackling two Greek concepts. Homo sophrune, <laughs> said that funny. Homo sophrune and oikos. Until next time, I'm Alexandra and I am still a bibliophile. I just, I'm sorry, I have to I have to laugh at myself there for a second because have you ever watched like Alex Trebek speak French and he sounds so snobby, but because he's using like a really nice accent, I'm really sorry. I sounded so snobby there reading those Greek words. Okay.
Bye. See you guys next time.